Hello everybody, this is Tekka. In this video, what we're doing is checking out the Geekom GT1 Mega. While we are gonna highlight this mini PC, my main focus is trying out this new Intel Core U9-185H CPU. I have been using it for roughly two weeks as my primary computer. I'm actually recording this video on it right now. So we're gonna do some benchmarking, some Windows versus Linux action, and I'll let you know my experiences, any hiccups that I've seen throughout the process. Now, a full disclosure from the gate, Geekom is a channel sponsor. They have sponsored other videos in the past. So there may be some bias there, but there are some cons with this device and I will be getting into those. And I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the actual UI, the build, and what it takes to tear it down. So looking at the front here, and the thing that caught my eye the most was it is absolutely loaded with USB-A's. With everybody switching to USB-C, I did think that it was interesting that, that they would stack four of them right here on the front. These are USB 3.2 Gen 2, so the speed is there. And then looking over, we have a standard headphone jack and the power button. And then flipping it over to the back, this is another thing that caught my attention. The fact it has 2.5 gigabit per second RJ45, or Ethernet ports which I love it when companies include two of these because then it gives potential to use it for like a PFSense firewall and you could use it as a router or if you use it as like a virtualization machine with something like Proxmox you can dedicate one of the uh, Ethernet ports to a specific VM or container. Now unfortunately there is no display port but it has two HDMI 2.0s. There are two USB 4.0 type C with one of them supporting power in which is lovely. And then on the back, we have an additional just standard USB-A 3.2 port. And then on one of the sides, we have an SD card reader. So the IO is nice, but the thing kind of looks like a standard mini PC. They didn't go kind of outrageous or super cool with any of the uh, external features or functionality. It's just a standard gray box. <laughs> now where I have some beef with this little mini PC is opening it up and tearing it apart. Unlike some of the other devices we checked out that like literally pop open and allow you to upgrade the RAM and storage and all that, this one you gotta work for a little bit. You have to pull out the little foot pad stickers, which sucks. You unscrew the first, the exterior shell backing, and then you have to screw off another one, the heat sink or the heat sink for the actual SSDs that you could put in there. Now this one did ship with a crucial two terabyte uh, NVMe Gen 4, as well as 32 gigabytes of dual channel DDR5 memory at 5600 megahertz supporting up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. But what we're really here to check out is the Intel Core Ultra Processor that it comes with. This one has Meteor Lake 7 nanometer technology with a total core count of 16 cores, six of them being the performance cores, while eight of them are the efficiency cores, and then you have two low power efficient cores. Which then that kind of takes me into the power consumption of this device standing at idle with the machine completely off it is going to pull a little bit of power specifically it was hovering around like 1.4 to 1.6 watts sometimes dropping under a watt with the computer booted on and just a windows desktop with nothing really going on other than some background processes it was hovering about 15 watts big shout out to those uh, efficiency cores and then doing something a little bit more power intensive, such as gaming, we saw the wattage hovering in between 70 and 80 watts. Which, speaking of gaming, I was actually moderately impressed. This is probably one of the better gaming machines for a mini PC that I've used. The integrated Intel Arc graphics are doing a lot better than uh, previous generations where most games are almost unplayable. Playing something slightly graphically intensive, such as Fortnite with uh, 1080p, kind of lower settings, I saw the frame rates hovering from like the higher 30s to mid 40s for frames per second. And you can see there in the corner, CPU activity is pretty low with memory utilization of 60%, but the GPU activity is cooking with the GPU using 43 watts or somewhat around there of total power. And just to see, I did kind of drop Fortnite down to the lowest settings possible watch it, it looks like garbage. But doing that, we actually saw frame rates rather high at like 112 and somewhere around there when it comes to the frame rate. So if you do want to sacrifice the graphic quality, you can achieve pretty high frame rates in a game like this. Additionally, I tried out a game like City Skylines and that performed completely fine. I didn't notice uh, any like stuttering, any bad anti-aliasing artifacts or anything like that. But for these gameplays, my capture card wasn't really working, so do note that even with these frame rates, I was recording this on OBS 
on the actual machine. So chances are OBS was taking up a slight amount of the resources. So I probably could have gotten a little bit better performance out of some of these games. And then I tried out uh, Call of Duty, the uh, newer Modern Warfare one. And it was very similar to Fortnite with frames hovering in the higher 40s to 50s. So, and at 1080p, it's a playable experience. Definitely don't buy this to be a gaming rig, but if you are doing other things and you want to game on it, the option is there. And then doing something that doesn't require as much system resources, such as Minecraft, the frames were absolutely cooking at times, hitting 300 frames per second. And it was the first time that I actually saw the full refresh rate of this monitor that I got that goes up to 240 hertz. And in Minecraft, even bumping up all the quality, the render chunks and all that, I was still getting at like 120 frames per second, which is great. Now the most comparable kind of gaming thing or CPU that I have to compare this to is this Minus Form tablet, which I actually also used as my primary uh, machine for quite a bit. Review on this, full review on this coming soon. So do subscribe for that. This one is rocking the AMD Ryzen 7 uh, 8840U and running the Valley Benchmark, kind of comparing these at 1080p ultra quality with DirectX 11 running. We saw the Intel Core machine get a score of 2636 while this AMD Ryzen machine got a score of 2398. And again, these aren't one for one CPUs. This is the best thing I have to compare it to. And then when it comes to OpenGL, there is a slightly wider gap with the Intel Core scoring 2731 and the AMD Ryzen getting 2391. And when it comes to the Geekbench graphics performance testing, we kind of saw some of the same uh, deviations with the scoring with the Vulkan testing for the Intel Core coming at uh, 37,000 versus AMD's uh, 34,000. And then with OpenCL, we have Intel at almost 40,000 and the AMD Ryzen at 28,000. And now for some of the uh, kind of traditional Geekbench scoring uh, processor, single versus multi-core scores are a little bit tighter here with the single core score performance of this uh, Geekon machine with the Intel scoring 2445 and then the AMD one outperforming it at 2541. And then with multi-core, the AMD machine got just above 11,000 while the uh, Intel machine scored 13,000 500. What's to be fair to the AMD machine, this uh, Intel one has 16 cores, 22 threads again, while the AMD machine has eight cores, 16 threads. So actually a surprisingly close score if you do consider the uh, thread counts and all that. Now I'm not really a fan of AI. I don't use it, especially when it comes to like local things on my machine, except for in my home lab, I have a little MPU from Google that I use for like uh, object detection and things like that. It's been working okay. <laughs> but one of the selling points of this uh, Intel processor is it has a integrated MPU for those AI tasks. And Geekbench actually has a AI benchmark tool that I was able to use. And I got a couple different scores and I did compare it to this uh, Ryzen, which I do not believe has an MPU. CPU Onyx scores, it does score slightly higher at 41 versus 38. When we look at CPU Open VNIO, the AMD machine actually scores considerably higher at 13,000 versus almost 8,000. And then for DirectML Onyx, the AMD is still ahead, 4,700 versus 2,600. But where we see the MPU shine is when we run a GPU open Vino benchmark, completely blowing all of the other scores out of the water with just above 19,000 points. And when it comes to all these Geekbench results, I'll link down below. So if you want to, you could dive in here and get some more specifics and all the different variables and testing. So if something in here is more important to you, you can figure out the scores there. Now for my personal review, like I said, I've been using this for a couple weeks as my primary machine for recording videos, video editing, and everything. And honestly, it has performed pretty good. I, I have no real huge complaints. Everything's smooth, fluid. The processor is awesome. This is probably the, I, I don't buy expensive computers. I don't have a whole, like super big dedicated rig to a lot of the things I do. I just kind of use these devices that I'm sent and test them with my daily usage. And of course, when it comes to general tasks, web browsing, photo editing, things like that, it performs remarkably. Like you saw for me, I'm not a huge gamer, so the gaming performance I do get out of it is good enough for my specific use case. The main thing I do on this computer that is probably the most attentive is video editing and rendering out videos. 
Uh, and for the most part, I use DaVinci Resolve. I have not had any significant issues scrubbing through the timeline, playing back things. Where I do notice it start to hiccup a little bit is when I start going into fusion and I add like layers and layers of effects. For example, one shot I did in a previous video going over that little Chinese phone, I had like four different 2K videos that I kind of cropped down to show them all at the same time with a blur background and it did not like that. <laughs> Very stuttery, didn't want to play it through, but that's few and far in between, so it wasn't really a bottleneck in my use case, but if you're somebody who does those kind of effects all the time in your video editing, you might want to look somewhere else, as doing really intensive things like that is where I start to see a bottleneck with this device. And from there, the only other real problem that I noticed, and it probably has to do with the current state of those uh, Intel Arc drivers, is I have a multi-monitor kind of setup here, one, a uh, landscape, one vertical, and sometimes I was getting that classic kind of a uh, Windows drag artifact error, but that's really the only big issue that I've noticed. It hasn't gone in the way of anything. I turn off the monitor, turn it back on, it usually corrects itself, and that's only happened two different times so far. So those have been my two main issues. Other than that, this is a crazy performant machine. With the two terabytes and all that, this would probably make a pretty good Proxmox box. Granted, I need to look more into how Proxmox handles the uh, different cores versus the efficiency and some of those base level performance cores. I am curious to how all that will run. I might kind of benchmark it and test it for that in a future video. Uh, let me know down below if you'd actually be interested in seeing that. Right now I have an Intel Nook in there that's, uh, I think it's a 13th gen like i5 that's running my uh, Nextcloud and Udo instance. So I could see me switching this out for that in the future, but We'll see, we'll see with time. And again, big thank you to Geekom for being a channel supporter, channel sponsor, and sending this over for me to go ahead and play with and check out, I do appreciate it. And if you are interested in checking out this device, I will leave a link down below so you can kind of review all the specs and everything yourself, as well as links to the benchmarking and basically anything else that I mentioned in this video. And with all that, again, let me know what you think about it. Intel definitely seems to kind of be catching up when it comes to the uh, mobile processors versus some of these uh, AMD machines. Granted, this is a super, super powerful CPU in a tablet. That alone is wild. Again, subscribe so you don't miss that video. And with all that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day and good bye. And, and before the video cuts out, I would like to apologize. I have a uh, COVID and my voice is shot. I can't breathe through my nose, so sorry if I sound like garbage during this video.